Thank you, Ron. Uh, rough play has been a point of emphasis over the last 10 years. And not only do you have rough play here in Wyoming, uh, we have rough play all over the country. And we've been uh, working very hard back in the state of Iowa, uh, trying to find a way in which that we can uh, better train our officials, uh, better assist our officials in, in understanding the guidelines and, uh, and officiating rough play. Uh, as you're all aware, uh, when we uh, get into talking about officiating and, and uh, we talk about offense and defense, and it's very important that we keep a balance between offense and defense as we officiate and write rules and go out and administer the game of basketball. Uh, it's very important that we keep skill and finesse as a vital part of the game of basketball. And I think we all understand and we all know that physical play can dominate finesse if we allow it to. We cannot continue to accept the fact that that's the way the game is played. We cannot uh, continue to accept the fact that that's the way the game is coached. Yes, coaches are a very important aspect of this whole program that we're talking about here tonight. Uh, they play a major role as it relates to how the game of basketball is played. So coaches have to buy into this as well as the officials as we talk about uh, the guidelines for coaching and officiating rough play in the game of basketball. But when it comes to game time, you officials are the ones that are responsible for enforcing the rules within the spirit and intent for which the rules were written by our rules makers. The trend in officiating as it relates to rough play has been to warn or to caution players, to try to talk the players out uh, of rough play. It's obvious that this has fallen on deaf ears or this particular aspect of the game of basketball would not be a point of emphasis for 10 years in a row. Cautions and warnings are not enforcement. Tempo and flow in the game of basketball are generated by the enforcement of the rules. So officials, what my intent is with this video is to try to assist you in having some guidelines in which we may officiate the game as it relates to rough play. Rough play basically falls into six categories in my opinion. We have hand checking that can lead to a lot of rough play. We have screening that leads to a lot of contact that will lead to rough play. And of course, we all know when those big guys get down in under the basket and we get into what's called post play, there is a great deal of rough play. We also have rough play on rebounding, not only during normal play, but particularly during free throw administration. And then, of course, all of us have seen those situations with the block charge in the game of basketball where a player gets knocked to the floor and there is no whistle and play continues. And, you know, for, because of, of, of the nature of the action, we had rough play involved or the player would not have been displaced and, and put on the floor uh, because of the contact. And then the last area that I want to relate to in the video is called loose ball contact. Uh, we're seeing more and more loose ball situations where players are diving on the floor, going after loose balls, and rough play is imminent in, in trying to retrieve the ball. Uh, we've placed an emphasis on this particular aspect of the game, and we've done a lot of writing, we've done a lot of talking about it, but it doesn't get to doesn't seem to get the job done. So our intent here tonight is to talk about guidelines that we need to look for in officiating to determine what's a foul and what's not a foul as it relates to rough play. This is kind of a new approach and a new direction and we hope that it'll be beneficial uh, to each of you officials and coaches that are watching this video. We'll now talk about the six aspects of rough play that I, I've mentioned. 
But first of all, there are two very important statements that I, I, I would like to make, and, and I think that each of you should uh, make note of these. First of all, any tactic using the hands, arm, or body that allows a player, offense or defense, to control, hold, impede, push, divert, slow down, or prevent the movement of an opposing player should always be called a foul. And the second statement I would make relative to rough play is that any act or tactic using the illegal use of hands, arms, or body, either offensively or defensively, that intentionally slows, prevents, impedes, or displaces an opposing player due to contact is always a foul. Let's take hand checking. And there's three things in hand checking that I would like to demonstrate with this young man uh, here. Uh, he's going to be the offensive player. I'm going to be the defensive player. And these are three areas in hand checking that if you officials will call fouls, we will re remove hand checking from the game of basketball. Now, we all know that there's going to be some touching as the defensive player measures up and gets into position. As players move up and down the floor, there's going to be some rubbing of the shoulders or the body a little bit in getting to position. But once a defensive player is in position to guard that offensive player and he continuously places a hand and the hand remains on the offensive player, it should always be a foul. Second point, any time the defensive player places both hands on the offensive player, it should always be a foul. The third point that I will make is that the offensive player penetrates, and this is the one that probably happens most often and goes uncalled, the defensive player will put a hand to slow or impede so he doesn't get beat, get a forearm into this player, move the knee or the body or the hip so that he can recover and continue to guard. But any impediment by the hand, the forearm, the hip, the thigh, the knee, should be a foul. The second aspect of rough play I'd like to talk about is screening. We all know that there is a lot of contact during screens. And by the rule, we can have contact in, screen, in screening situations. It's called incidental contact. But we all know when a screener comes up to set a screen from the side, not always is the opponent going to see this screen being set, and there will be some contact because of the opponent's movement into the screener. But in order to officiate screening properly, we have to understand the principles of screening. First of all, we will set screens in visual view of the opponent. Now, visual view does not necessarily have to be in front. It can be to the side because of peripheral vision. But any time we set a screen from the front or the side within the visual field of the opponent, the thing we have to remember, by rule, we can get as close to the opponent as we want, short of contact, and we must be in a stationary position. So I can be up right in this position here and have a legal screen as long as I'm in his visual field. And the same thing if I set the screen from the front. There's no time or distance involved. Stationary, short of contact, it's legal. Now what happens in screening? And we've already talked about the incidental contact because of the player's movement. If he doesn't displace me or not allow me to be able to continue to play defense, that's incidental contact and should not be called a foul. However, where we get the fouls that aren't called, and all these players are coached to go over the screen or under the screen to, to get through the screener and be able to continue to play uh, uh, defense. So I'm setting a screen. Now, I'm legal in this, in this uh, particular situation. Now he attempts to go over the top of the screen, and now I impede him by chucking him with the forearm, holding him with the hand, extending my body out of my legal guarding position, extending a hip or a knee, 
to impede him from being able to continue in his pattern. That should always be called a foul. Now the second screening situation I'm going to talk about is a, what we call a blind screen or a screen from behind. Whenever a screen is set outside the visual field of that opponent, we must allow him one normal step backward to be legal. So if he takes a normal step backward, this would be a legal screen. However, if I'm in this position and he takes a normal step backward and it causes contact, that is an illegal screen and is a foul on me. Now the same thing applies here. I set a legal screen from the blind side or from the back. He takes a normal step back. He sees that the screen is set. Now he tries to go over the top, and I impede by holding him, by chucking him with the forearm, and trying to impede his progress in the pattern. And many times in basketball games, we as officials kind of get into the trend of ball watching. And we get backside screens and screens away from the ball or on the weak side. And then we get cutters coming off of those screens, and that's where we're getting the forearms, the hand checking, and the impediment that we have to have the off official, the official off the ball, watching and calling fouls in order to clean up this aspect of rough play in the game as it relates to screening. The next aspect of rough play we'll talk about and demonstrate is rough play in the post area. Uh, post play probably can be the roughest area of the game if we allow it to be. Uh, we know that players are getting bigger, faster, and stronger all the time. And uh, when we still are playing the game on the same size of floors that we did years ago, when they weren't as big and fast and strong as they are today, with the same number of players, we are going to have contact. Now, keys keep in mind, we all understand that players are going to move up and down the floor and there's going to be some incidental body contact in getting into position and getting down low around the basket in what we call the post area. Now, what I would like to do is demonstrate some positions with our player here relative to the defender as it relates to post play. Now, we all know that we can defend from the front. I'm the defense, he's the offense. We can also step out here and play defense from the side and front and try to prevent the ball from being entered and, and, and these types of things, some double teaming and so forth. And then the third aspect of defending the post player is, is from behind. And I truly believe most of the contact takes place when the offensive player is in position and the defensive player is guarding from behind. Because the first thing that happens is a coach does not want that offensive player to get to the position on the court that he wants to be to set up to run their offense. So what happens is we get the, the leg, the knee, the thigh in and we try to root that player out from that position. When we get this type of contact, it must always be a foul. The next thing we see in post play is we see the player that likes to get the forearm in the back of that offensive player. Now we can control. And one thing that we've told our officials back in Iowa, when does this become a foul? If that forearm is just like the hand checking that we talked about, continuously stays there. If I'm just bending down and the forearm touches and I get it off, I don't think we want to call those fouls all the time. But if that forearm stays there, now I'm in a position of controlling. And then it is definitely a foul when we see pressure, and we see pressure when we see extension. Anytime you see extension of that forearm against that opponent, it should be a foul. And the same thing with the hands in the back. As we play with the hand on the back, if that hand continuously stays there, it should be a foul. And then anytime we see pressure or extension, it is automatically a foul. Now as we defend from the side, and I'll move my player around here a little bit, the thing that we'll watch a lot of times is the ball and what's happening here in front. Don't forget about the hook that takes play by the defensive player that, that does not allow that player 
uh, to, to move out from that position. Or getting the thigh and the knee locked in to the player, offensive player's thigh and knee so that we can control them and not let them move. But these are some areas from the defensive point of view. Now, from an offensive point of view, I would like to talk about a couple of things that we allow to occur that we shouldn't allow to occur. First, the offensive player gets the ball and he wants to get deeper. And so we allow the offensive player to put the ball on the floor and dribble back in to the defensive player and move him out of his legal guarding position. The second aspect is what we call the swim stroke. We get the offensive player that's being fronted by the defense and the offensive player wants to move around so he brings the arm up over the top and hooks the defensive player with the swim stroke so now he can receive the entry pass. This must always be a foul. And then of course the other favorite one that we see a lot and, and we don't get called enough is when that offensive player does not allow that defensive player to come around in front from or from the side to, to defend. And we use the hook to keep him back out of that position. Uh, and that also always must be a foul. Cool. Rebounding is another aspect of the game that leads to a lot of rough play. Uh, the principles that we should be applying as it relates to rebounding are some of the things that we've already talked about. Establishing a position on the floor. Any position a player can get to legally is, is, is that player's position. Uh, what a legal position is. Uh, the stance on the floor, right up through the shoulders, with the uh, hands in a, in a position to uh, receive the ball as it's coming off on a missed shot. Uh, that is legal position. What happens we have two aspects of rebounding. We have the opponent of the player blocking out that likes to try to push the player under the basket, uh, will come up onto the back of the player, or swim stroke over the top of the player to hook them to get into a better position to rebound. And then the other aspect is the player that's got the inside position trying to maintain that position but doing it illegally. Let's demonstrate a few of those situations. I will demonstrate the player with the inside position. The basket is up here uh, where I have my hand at this time and my opponent is on, on my back. Uh, I feel that I'm too close. I've got legal position and now I try to get greater position by moving my opponent back farther so that he's not a threat to get that rebound. If he's come up and established a position there and I displace him by moving back into him, that is a foul on me. The other thing that happens in a rebounding is that opponent tries to move around to get a position is we'll drop the arm and try to hold or hook him from being able to move freely and that is always a foul. And then the next thing that I, that's always a foul is when that player tries to move around and we move our body into the opponent. Now remember, the rules allow us to slide laterally as he moves around. This is legal, but not if I move into him and impede him as he tries to move around. That should always be a foul. Now I'm going to put him on the inside position, and here we get the situation again like we get in post play where I try to push him under the basket as that shot goes up. And remember, if there's pressure and extension, that should always be a foul. Likewise, he's reaching up to rebound and I come up underneath of him to try to undercut should always be a foul. And then, of course, just the normal hands in the back. Remember, we said in hand checking, anytime two hands goes on the opponent, it's always a foul. Or the one hand that's continuously on the opponent and we get pressure and extension should always be a, called a foul as it relates to rebounding. We also have a lot of rebounding problems on, on uh, free throw situations and the same principles apply on normal playing action as it would in blocking out on the free throws. 
The next aspect of rough play is loose ball contact. Probably six or seven, maybe eight years ago, uh, this was not a big concern in the game of basketball. Uh, we've added loose ball contact to the list of, of rough play areas that, that needs uh, our attention and that we need some guidelines to officiate by. The point that I like to make is when a, we have a loose ball situation and players are going to the floor scrambling for that loose ball, assume that the players were on their feet scrambling for the same loose ball. And if we would get body checks, forearm checks, you know, people diving into that player on their feet, we always make those calls and they're always fouls. But as soon as we get players on the floor scrambling for that loose ball, it seems that we swallow our whistles and we don't get the fouls called that need to be called and we get into some dangerous situations as it relates to injury and we give some great advantage to players that really don't have the right to go after the loose ball. Example, we have a loose ball. We have opponents going after the loose ball and they're on the floor. Both players have the right to that ball. But if one player impedes the other player by trying to prevent that opponent from getting to that loose ball, it should be a foul. Just like if a player impeded a player on their feet attempting to go after a loose ball in, in that situation. The other thing that I want to mention is once a player possesses the ball on the floor, it's the same as if that player possessed the ball standing up. And would we let people dive into them, put shoulders into them, you know, roll over on top of them if they were on their feet? The answer is no. That would always be a foul. Well, when those players are on the floor and in possession of the ball and people are diving in on them or slamming into them on the floor, we need to be calling fouls. Those are always fouls. The last area of rough play that I would like to talk about is the block charge. Uh, many people feel that the block charge is the hardest aspect of basketball officiating to officiate. Um, I think the reason for that is that many times in block charge situations, officials get caught by surprise. Why do they get caught by surprise? Probably because we're watching the ball and we're not officiating the defense like is necessary to be a good block charge official. If we know the status of the defensive player, when we sense these block charge situations coming, we're going to get the block charge right most of the time if we're officiating the defense. To understand and to be able to officiate block charge within the spirit and intent of the rule, we have to understand what legal guarding position is and how a player a, a, a attains a legal guarding position. Now the rules of basketball tell us that in order to be in a legal guarding position, a player must have both feet on the floor and be facing his opponent. So once I get both feet on the floor and I face my opponent, I have attained a legal guarding position. Now, once I've established this position, a lot of people feel that I've got to keep both feet on the floor if there's contact taking place. That could not be farther from the truth. I can move to maintain a legal guarding position once I have established it. In other words, as long as I don't move into him or impede him by moving in to cut him off, I can move to maintain a legal position. To demonstrate, I'm going to have him move slowly around me and I step laterally, I'm perfectly legal. Even though we might have some contact here while I have a foot off the floor, I am still in legal position because I have not moved into him, I have not impeded him. Likewise, I can move backwards as he comes toward me and maintain a legal guarding position. And if he moves quicker than I and we have contact, I'm still legal even though I'm moving or even though I may have a foot or feet off the floor. Now, 
The other aspects of the black charge that we have to talk about is the player with the ball and the player without the basketball. First of all, we'll talk about the player with the ball. When a player has the ball, by rule, time and distance is no factor as it relates to the block charge. In other words, I could be over, not in a, in a guarding position, jump over in front of him and get into a guarding position without any distance required and he would be responsible for the contact. Now, I'm going to have him move slowly toward me, and we're going to demonstrate this again. I'm off over here looking in another area, and I come over and I set up in front of him. If I get both feet on the floor and face him, I am legal. Now any contact that takes place, he is responsible, and that would be a player control foul. Now, without the basketball, time and distance become a factor. When I guard an opponent without the basketball, I have to give them time to stop or change directions up to a maximum of two strides. So if I'm going to get into a guarding position and he's moving down the floor, I have to give him time to stop or change directions to be legal. Now. If he's coming down the floor without the ball and I jump over in front of him and there's contact, I did not give him time to stop or change directions. It's a blocking foul on me. So, in summary, the things we have to remember about the block charge is first, you have to officiate the defense. You have to know where the defensive player is at. Secondly, do they have the ball or do they not have the ball? If the ball is involved, time and distance are no factor. He is responsible for contact if I get to that spot legally. Without the ball, time and distance become a factor, and we must give him time to stop or change directions up to a maximum of two strides. In closing, I'd like to summarize a little bit. Uh, please keep in mind that every illegal contact, which is not called, encourages and leads to rough play. It's very important that we all understand and realize that the same rules that are written, you know, for our varsity teams are also the rules that we play junior varsity, sophomore, freshman, and junior high games by. It's understanding the spirit and intent of the rule. All of us turn on the television and watch the NBA and, and NCAA uh, Division I games uh, practically every night of the week during the winter. We can't allow some of the things that are allowed in those levels to come down and be a part of our high school game. They're playing with the very best. The NBA is playing with people that are playing basketball for their livelihood. That's their profession. The college coaches go out and recruit the very best off of every high school team and put their teams together. In the high schools, it's an activity for student participation. And we have millions of students across our country playing basketball at various levels. Therefore, we must understand the spirit and intent of the rule and officiate in accordance to these guidelines to maintain what we want from the game of basketball. Rough play has not been a point of emphasis for the last 10 years just to have a point of emphasis. It's because the people responsible for the game of high school basketball feel that we're allowing an advantage to rough play. When I opened up this session, we talked about skill and finesse being a very important part and that physical play will dominate skill and finesse. We do not want domination of skill and finesse. We still want the five foot seven inch player to be a part of the game of basketball. We don't want it dominated by the big, strong, tough players. We want all kids at all levels that have skills in the game of basketball 
to be able to compete equally. So please keep in mind that these guidelines are for our coaches to coach by and you officials to officiate by to hopefully improve in an area that is a concern across the country in high school basketball. Thank you. It's been my pleasure to uh, spend a few minutes with you talking about the point of emphasis in rough play in the game of high school basketball.